Moby Dick. Chapter 91. The Pequod Meets the Rosebud. In vain it was to rake for amber greasy in the paunch of this leviathan, insufferable fader denying not inquiry. Sir T. Brown, V. E. It was a week or two after the last whaling scene recounted, and when we were slowly sailing over a sleepy, vapory, midday sea, that the many noses on the Pequod's deck proved more vigilant discoverers than the three pairs of eyes aloft. A peculiar and not very pleasant smell was smelt in the sea. I will bet something now, said Stubb, that some are hereabouts or some of those drugged whales we tickled the other day. I thought they would keel up before long. Presently, the vapors in advance slid aside, and there in the distance lay a ship, whose furled sails betokened that some sort of whale must be alongside. As we glided nearer, the stranger showed French colors from his peak, and by the eddying cloud of vulture seafowl that circled, and hovered, and swooped around him, it was plain that the whale alongside must be what the fishermen call a blasted whale, that is, a whale that has died unmolested on the sea, and so floated an unappropriated corpse. It may well be conceived, what an unsavory odor such a mass must exhale, worse than an Assyrian city in the plague, when the living are incompetent to bury the departed. So intolerable indeed is it regarded by some, that no cupidity could persuade them to moor alongside of it. Yet are there those who will still do it, notwithstanding the fact that the oil obtained from such subjects is of a very inferior quality, and by no means of the nature of adder of rose. Coming still nearer with the expiring breeze, we saw that the Frenchman had a second whale alongside, and this second whale seemed even more of a nosegay than the first. In truth, it turned out to be one of those problematical whales that seem to dry up and die with a sort of prodigious dyspepsia, or indigestion, leaving their defunct bodies almost entirely bankrupt of anything like oil. Nevertheless, in the proper place we shall see that no knowing fisherman will ever turn up his nose at such a whale as this, however much he may shun blasted whales in general. The Pequot had now swept so nigh to the stranger, that Stubb vowed he recognized his cutting spade pole entangled in the lines that were knotted round the tail of one of these whales. There's a pretty fellow, now, he banteringly laughed, standing in the ship's bows, there's a jackal for ye. I well know that these crapos of Frenchmen are, but poor devils in the fishery, sometimes lowering their boats for breakers, mistaking them for sperm whale spouts, yes, and sometimes sailing from their port with their hold full of boxes of tallow candles and cases of snuffers, foreseeing that all the oil they will get won't be enough to dip the captain's wick into, I, we all know these things, but look he, here's a crapo that is content with our leavings, the drugged whale there, I mean. Aye, and is content too with scraping the dry bones of that other precious fish he has there. Poor devil. I say, pass round a hat, someone, and let's make him a present of a little oil for dear charity's sake. For what oil he'll get from that drugged whale there, wouldn't be fit to burn in a jail, no, not in a condemned cell. And as for the other whale, why, I'll agree to get more oil by chopping up and trying out these three masts of ours, than he'll get from that bundle of bones, though, now that I think of it, it may contain something worth a good deal more than oil, yes, ambergris. I wonder now if our old man has thought of that. It's worth trying. Yes, I'm for it, and so saying he started for the quarterdeck. By this time, the faint air had become a complete calm, so that whether or no, the Pequod was now fairly entrapped in the smell, with no hope of escaping except by its breezing up again. Issuing from the cabin, Stubb now called his boat's crew, and pulled off for the stranger. Drawing across her bow, he perceived that in accordance with the fanciful French taste, the upper part of her stem piece was carved in the likeness of a huge drooping stalk, was painted green, and for thorns had copper spikes projecting from it here and there, the whole terminating in a symmetrical folded bulb of a bright red color. Upon her headboards, in large gilt letters, he read Bouton de Rose, Rosebutton, or Rosebud, and this was the romantic name of this aromatic ship. Though Stubb did not understand the Boughton part of the inscription, yet the word rose, and the bulbous figurehead put together, sufficiently explained the whole to him. A wooden rosebud, eh, he cried with his hand to his nose, that will do very well, but how like all creation it smells. Now in order to hold direct communication with the people on deck, he had to pull round the bows to the starboard side, and thus come close to the blasted whale, and so talk over it. Arrived then at this spot, with one hand still to his nose, he bawled, Boughton de Rose, ahoy! Are there any of you Boughton de Roses that speak English? Yes, rejoined a Guernsey man from the bulwarks, who turned out to be the chief mate. Well, then, my Boughton de Rose bud, have you seen the white whale? What whale? The white whale, a sperm whale, Moby Dick, have ye seen him? Never heard of such a whale. 
Cachalot Blanche. White Whale, no. Very good, then, goodbye now, and I'll call again in a minute. Then rapidly pulling back towards the Pequod, and seeing Ahab leaning over the quarterdeck rail awaiting his report, he molded his two hands into a trumpet and shouted, No, sir. No. Upon which Ahab retired, and Stubb returned to the Frenchman. He now perceived that the Guernsey man, who had just got into the chains, and was using a cutting spade, had slung his nose in a sort of bag. What's the matter with your nose, there, said Stubb. Broke it? I wish it was broken, or that I didn't have any nose at all, answered the Guernsey man, who did not seem to relish the job he was at very much. But what are you holding yours for? Oh, nothing. It's a wax nose, I have to hold it on. Fine day, ain't it? Air rather gardeny, I should say, throw us a bunch of posies, will ye, Bouton de Rose? What in the devil's name do you want here, roared the Guernsey man, flying into a sudden passion. Oh. Keep cool, cool? Yes, that's the word. Why don't you pack those whales in ice while you're working at M? But joking aside, though, do you know, Rosebud, that it's all nonsense trying to get any oil out of such whales? As for that dried up one, there, he hasn't a gill in his whole carcass. I know that well enough, but, D.C., the captain here won't believe it, this is his first voyage, he was a cologne manufacturer before. But come aboard, and mayhap he'll believe you, if he won't me, and so I'll get out of this dirty scrape. Anything to oblige ye, my sweet and pleasant fellow, rejoined Stubb, and with that he soon mounted to the deck. There a queer scene presented itself. The sailors, in tasseled caps of red worsted, were getting the heavy tackles in readiness for the whales. But they worked rather slow and talked very fast, and seemed in anything but a good humor. All their noses upwardly projected from their faces like so many jib booms. Now and then pairs of them would drop their work and run up to the masthead to get some fresh air. Some thinking they would catch the plague, dipped oakum and coltar, and at intervals held it to their nostrils. Others having broken the stems of their pipes almost short off at the bowl, were vigorously puffing tobacco smoke, so that it constantly filled their olfactories. Stubb was struck by a shower of outcries and anathemas proceeding from the captain's roundhouse abaft, and looking in that direction saw a fiery face thrust from behind the door, which was held ajar from within. This was the tormented surgeon, who, after in vain remonstrating against the proceedings of the day, had beta ken himself to the captain's roundhouse, cabinet he called it, to avoid the pest, but still, could not help yelling out his entreaties and indignations at times. Marking all this, Stubb argued well for his scheme, and turning to the Guernsey man had a little chat with him, during which the stranger mate expressed his detestation of his captain as a conceited ignoramus, who had brought them all into so unsavory and unprofitable a pickle. Sounding him carefully, Stubb further perceived that the Guernsey man had not the slightest suspicion concerning the ambergris. He therefore held his peace on that head, but otherwise was quite frank and confidential with him so that the two quickly concocted a little plan for both circumventing and satirizing the captain, without his at all dreaming of distrusting their sincerity. According to this little plan of theirs, the Guernsey man, under cover of an interpreter's office, was to tell the captain what he pleased, but as coming from Stubb, and as for Stubb, he was to utter any nonsense that should come uppermost in him during the interview. By this time, their destined victim appeared from his cabin. He was a small and dark, but rather delicate-looking man for a sea captain, with large whiskers and mustache, however, and wore a red cotton velvet vest with watch seals at his side. To this gentleman, Stubb was now politely introduced by the Guernsey man, who had once ostentatiously put on the aspect of interpreting between them. What shall I say to him first, said he. Why, said Stubb, eyeing the velvet vest and the watch and seals, you may as well begin by telling him that he looks a sort of babbyish to me though I don't pretend to be a judge. He says, Monsieur, said the Guernsey man, in French, turning to his captain, that only yesterday his ship spoke a vessel, whose captain and chief mate, with six sailors, had all died of a fever caught from a blasted whale they had brought alongside. Upon this the captain started, and eagerly desired to know more. What now, said the Guernsey man to Stubb. Why, since he takes it so easy, tell him that now I abide him carefully, I'm quite certain that he's no more fit to command a whale ship than a St. Iago monkey. In fact, tell him from me he's a baboon. He vows and declares, monsieur, that the other whale, the dried one, is far more deadly than the blasted one, in fine, monsieur, he conjures us, as we value our lives, to cut loose from these fish. 
Instantly the captain ran forward, and in a loud voice, commanded his crew to desist from hoisting the cutting tackles, and at once cast loose the cables and chains, confining the whales to the ship. What now, said the Guernsey man, when the captain had returned to them. Why, let me see, yes, you may as well tell him now that, that, in fact, tell him I diddled him, and, aside to himself, perhaps somebody else. He says, monsieur, that he's very happy to have been of any service to us. Hearing this, the captain vowed that they were the grateful parties, meaning himself and mate, and concluded by inviting Stubb down into his cabin to drink a bottle of Bordeaux. He wants you to take a glass of wine with him, said the interpreter. Thank him heartily, but tell him it's against my principles to drink with the man I diddled. In fact, tell him I must go. He says, monsieur, that his principles won't admit of his drinking, but that if monsieur wants to live another day to drink, then monsieur had best drop all four boats, and pull the ship away from these whales, for it's so calm they won't drift. By this time Stubb was over the side, and getting into his boat, hailed the Guernsey man to this effect, that having a long towline in his boat, he would do what he could to help them, by pulling out the lighter whale of the two from the ship's side. While the Frenchman's boats, then, were engaged in towing the ship one way, Stubb benevolently towed away at his whale the other way, ostentatiously slacking out a most unusually long towline. Presently a breeze sprang up, Stubb feigned to cast off from the whale, hoisting his boats, the Frenchman soon increased his distance, while the Pequod slid in between him and Stubb's whale. Whereupon Stubb quickly pulled to the floating body, and hailing the Pequod to give notice of his intentions, at once proceeded to reap the fruit of his unrighteous cunning. Seizing his sharp boat spade, he commenced an excavation in the body, a little behind the side fin. You would almost have thought he was digging a cellar there in the sea, and when at length his spade struck against the gaunt ribs, it was like turning up old Roman tiles and pottery buried in fat English loam. His boat's crew were all in high excitement, eagerly helping their chief, and looking as anxious as gold hunters. And all the time numberless fowls were diving, and ducking, and screaming, and yelling, and fighting around them. Stubb was beginning to look disappointed, especially as the horrible nosegay increased, when suddenly from out the very heart of this plague, there stole a faint stream of perfume, which flowed through the tide of bad smells without being absorbed by it, as one river will flow into and then along with another, without it all blending with it for a time. I have it, I have it, cried Stubb, with delight, striking something in the subterranean regions, a purse. A purse. Dropping his spade, he thrust both hands in, and drew out handfuls of something that looked like ripe Windsor soap, or rich mottled old cheese, very unctuous and savory withal. You might easily dent it with your thumb, it is of a hue between yellow and ash color. And this, good friends, is ambergris, worth a gold guinea an ounce to any druggist. Some six handfuls were obtained, but more was unavoidably lost in the sea, and still more, perhaps, might have been secured were it not for impatient Ahab's loud command to stub to desist and come on board, else the ship would bid them goodbye. Chapter 92 Ambergris Now this ambergris is a very curious substance, and so important as an article of commerce, that in 1791 a certain Nantucket-born Captain Coffin was examined at the bar of the English House of Commons on that subject. For at that time, and indeed until a comparatively late day, the precise origin of ambergris remained, like amber itself, a problem to the learned. Though the word ambergris is but the French compound for grey amber, yet the two substances are quite distinct. For amber, though at times found on the seacoast, is also dug up in some far inland soils, whereas ambergris is never found except upon the sea. Besides, amber is a hard, transparent, brittle, odorless substance used for mouthpieces to pipes, for beads and ornaments, but ambergris is soft, waxy, and so highly fragrant and spicy that it is largely used in perfumery, in potiles, precious candles, hair powders, and pomatum. The Turks use it in cooking, and also carry it to Mecca, for the same purpose that frankincense is carried to St. Peter's in Rome. Some wine merchants drop a few grains into claret to flavor it. Who would think, then, that such fine ladies and gentlemen should regale themselves with an essence found in the inglorious bowels of a sick whale? Yet so it is. By some, ambergris is supposed to be the cause, and by others the effect, of the dyspepsia in the whale. How to cure such a dyspepsia it were hard to say, unless by administering three or four boatloads of Brandreth's pills, and then running out of harm's way, as laborers do in blasting rocks. I have forgotten to say that there were found in this ambergris certain hard, round, bony plates, which at first Stubb thought might be sailors' trousers buttons, 
but it afterwards turned out that they were nothing more than pieces of small squid bones embalmed in that manner. Now that the incorruption of this most fragrant ambergris should be found in the heart of such decay, is this nothing? Bethink thee of that saying of St. Paul in Corinthians, about corruption and incorruption, how that we are sown in dishonor, but raised in glory. And likewise call to mind that saying of Paracelsus about what it is that mocketh the best musk. Also forget not the strange fact that of all things of ill savor, cologne water, in its rudimental manufacturing stages, is the worst. I should like to conclude the chapter with the above appeal, but cannot, owing to my anxiety to repel a charge often made against whalemen, and which, in the estimation of some already biased minds, might be considered as indirectly substantiated by what has been said of the Frenchman's two whales. Elsewhere in this volume the slanderous aspersion has been disproved, that the vocation of whaling is throughout a slatternly, untidy business. But there is another thing to rebut. They hint that all whales always smell bad. Now how did this odious stigma originate? I opine that it is plainly traceable to the first arrival of the Greenland whaling ships in London, more than two centuries ago. Because those whalemen did not then, and do not now, try out their oil at sea as the southern ships have always done, but cutting up the fresh blubber in small bits, thrust it through the bungholes of large casks, and carry it home in that manner, the shortness of the season in those icy seas, and the sudden and violent storms to which they are exposed, forbidding any other course. The consequence is, that upon breaking into the hold, and unloading one of these whale cemeteries, in the Greenland dock, a savor is given forth somewhat similar to that arising from excavating an old city graveyard, for the foundations of a lying-in hospital. I partly surmise also, that this wicked charge against whalers may be likewise imputed to the existence on the coast of Greenland, in former times, of a Dutch village called Schmerenberg or Smerenberg, which latter name is the one used by the learned Fogo von Slack, in his great work on smells, a textbook on that subject. As its name imports, smear, fat, berg, to put up, this village was founded in order to afford a place for the blubber of the Dutch whale fleet to be tried out, without being taken home to Holland for that purpose. It was a collection of furnaces, fat kettles, and oil sheds, and when the works were in full operation certainly gave forth no very pleasant savor. But all this is quite different with a South Sea sperm whaler, which in a voyage of four years perhaps, after completely filling her hold with oil, does not, perhaps, consume fifty days in the business of boiling out, and in the state that it is cast, the oil is nearly scentless. The truth is, that living or dead, if but decently treated, whales as a species are by no means creatures of ill odor, nor can whalemen be recognized, as the people of the Middle Ages affected to detect a Jew in the company, by the nose. Nor indeed can the whale possibly be otherwise than fragrant, when, as a general thing, he enjoys such high health, taking abundance of exercise, always out of doors, though, it is true, seldom in the open air. I say, that the motion of a sperm whale's flukes above water dispenses a perfume, as when a musk-scented lady rustles her dress in a warm parlor. What then shall I liken the sperm whale to for fragrance, considering his magnitude? Must it not be to that famous elephant, with jeweled tusks, and redolent with myrrh, which was let out of an Indian town to do honor to Alexander the Great? Chapter 93 The Castaway It was but some few days after encountering the Frenchman that a most significant event befell the most insignificant of the Pequod's crew, an event most lamentable, and which ended in providing the sometimes madly merry and predestinated craft with a living and ever accompanying prophecy of whatever shattered sequel might prove her own. Now, in the whale ship, it is not everyone that goes in the boats. Some few hands are reserved called shipkeepers, whose province it is to work the vessel while the boats are pursuing the whale. As a general thing, these shipkeepers are as hardy fellows as the men comprising the boat's crews. But if there happen to be an unduly slender, clumsy, or timorous white in the ship, that white is certain to be made a shipkeeper. It was so in the Pequod with the little Negro Pippin by nickname, Pip by abbreviation. Poor Pip! Ye have heard of him before, ye must remember his tambourine on that dramatic midnight, so gloomy jolly. In outer aspect, Pip and Doughboy made a match, like a black pony and a white one, of equal developments, though of dissimilar color, driven in one eccentric span. But while hapless Doughboy was by nature dull and torpid in his intellects, Pip, though over tender hearted, was at bottom very bright, with that pleasant, genial, jolly brightness peculiar to his tribe, a tribe, which ever enjoy all holidays and festivities with finer, freer relish than any other race. For blacks, the year's calendar should show not but 365 Fourth of Julys and New Year's Days. Nor smile so, 
while I write that this little black was brilliant, for even blackness has its brilliancy, behold yon lustrous ebony, panelled in king's cabinets. But Pip loved life, and all life's peaceable securities, so that the panic-striking business in which he had somehow unaccountably become entrapped, had most sadly blurred his brightness, though, as ere long will be seen, what was thus temporarily subdued in him, in the end was destined to be luridly illumined by strange wildfires, that fictitiously showed him off to ten times the natural luster with which in his native Tallinn County in Connecticut, he had once enlivened many a fiddler. Frolic on the green, and at melodious eventide, with his gay ha ha, had turned the round horizon into one star bell tambourine. So, though in the clear air of day, suspended against a blue vein neck, the pure water diamond drop will healthful glow, yet, when the cunning jeweler would show you the diamond in its most impressive luster, he lays it against a gloomy ground, and then lights it up, not by the sun, but by some unnatural gases. Then come out those fiery effulgences, infernally superb, then the evil blazing diamond, once the divinest symbol of the crystal skies, looks like some crown jewel stolen from the king of hell. But let us to the story. It came to pass, that in the ambergris affair Stubbs after Orsman chanced so to sprain his hand, as for a time to become quite maimed, and, temporarily, Pip was put into his place. The first time Stubb lowered with him, Pip evinced much nervousness, but happily, for that time, escaped close contact with the whale, and therefore came off not altogether discreditably, though Stubb observing him, took care, afterwards, to exhort him to cherish his courageousness to the utmost, for he might often find it needful. Now upon the second lowering, the boat paddled upon the whale, and as the fish received the darted iron, it gave its customary rap, which happened, in this instance, to be right under poor Pip's seat. The involuntary consternation of the moment caused him to leap, paddle in hand, out of the boat, and in such a way, that part of the slack whale line coming against his chest, he breasted it overboard with him, so as to become entangled in it, when at last plumping into the water. That instant the stricken whale started on a fierce run, the line swiftly straightened, and presto! Poor Pip came all foaming up to the chocks of the boat, remorselessly dragged there by the line, which had taken several turns around his chest and neck. Tashtego stood in the bows. He was full of the fire of the hunt. He hated Pip for a poltroon. Snatching the boat knife from its sheath, he suspended its sharp edge over the line, and turning towards Stubb, exclaimed interrogatively, Cut? Meantime Pip's blue, choked face plainly looked, do, for God's sake. All passed in a flash. In less than half a minute, this entire thing happened. Damn him, cut, roared Stubb, and so the whale was lost and Pip was saved. So soon as he recovered himself, the poor little negro was assailed by yells and execrations from the crew. Tranquilly permitting these irregular cursings to evaporate, Stubb then, in a plain, businesslike, but still half humorous manner, cursed Pip officially, and that done, unofficially gave him much wholesome advice. The substance was, never jump from a boat, Pip, except, but all the rest was indefinite, as the soundest advice ever is. Now, in general, stick to the boat, is your true motto in whaling, but cases will sometimes happen when leap from the boat, is still better. Moreover, as if perceiving at last that if he should give undiluted conscientious advice to Pip, he would be leaving him too wide a margin to jump in for the future, Stubb suddenly dropped all advice, and concluded with a peremptory command, stick to the boat, Pip, or by the Lord, I won't pick you up if you jump, mind that. We can't afford to lose whales by the likes of you, a whale would sell for thirty times what you would, Pip, in Alabama. Bear that in mind, and don't jump any more. Hereby perhaps Stubb indirectly hinted, that though man loved his fellow, yet man is a money-making animal, which propensity too often interferes with his benevolence. But we are all in the hands of the gods, and Pip jumped again. It was under very similar circumstances to the first performance, but this time he did not breast out the line, and hence, when the whale started to run, Pip was left behind on the sea, like a hurried traveler's trunk. Alas! Stubb was, but too true to his word. It was a beautiful, bounteous blue day, the spangled sea calm and cool, and flatly stretching away, all round, to the horizon, like gold beater's skin hammered out to the extremist. Bobbing up and down in that sea, Pip's ebon head showed like a head of cloves. No boat knife was lifted when he fell so rapidly astern. Stubbs' inexorable back was turned upon him, and the whale was winged. In three minutes, a whole mile of shoreless ocean was between Pip and Stubb. Out from the center of the sea, poor Pip turned his crisp, curling, black head to the sun, another lonely castaway, though the loftiest and the brightest. 
Now, in calm weather, to swim in the open ocean is as easy to the practiced swimmer as to ride in a spring carriage ashore. But the awful lonesomeness is intolerable. The intense concentration of self in the middle of such a heartless immensity, my God! Who can tell it? Mark, how when sailors in a dead calm bathe in the open sea mark how closely they hug their ship and only coast along her sides. But had Stubb really abandoned the poor little negro to his fate? No, he did not mean to, at least. Because there were two boats in his wake, and he supposed, no doubt, that they would of course come up to Pip very quickly, and pick him up, though, indeed, such considerations towards oarsmen jeopardized through their own timidity, is not always manifested by the hunters in all similar instances, and such instances not unfrequently occur, almost invariably in the fishery, a coward, so called, is marked with the same ruthless detestation peculiar to military navies and armies. But it so happened that those boats, without seeing Pip, suddenly spying whales close to them on one side, turned, and gave chase, and Stubbs' boat was now so far away, and he and all his crew so intent upon his fish, that Pip's ringed horizon began to expand around him miserably. By the merest chance the ship itself at last rescued him, but from that hour the little negro went about the deck an idiot, such, at least, they said he was. The sea had jeeringly kept his finite body up, but drowned the infinite of his soul. Not drowned entirely, though. Rather carried down alive to wondrous depths, where strange shapes of the unwarped primal world glided to and fro before his passive eyes, and the miser merman, wisdom, revealed his hoarded heaps, and among the joyous, heartless, ever juvenile eternities, Pip saw the multitudinous, god omnipresent, coral insects, that out of the firmament of waters heaved the colossal orbs. He saw God's foot upon the treadle of the loom, and spoke it, and therefore his shipmates called him mad. So man's insanity is heaven's sense, and wandering from all mortal reason, man comes at last to that celestial thought, which, to reason, is absurd and frantic, and weal or woe, feels then uncompromised, indifferent as his God. For the rest, blame not Stubb too hardly. The thing is common in that fishery, and in the sequel of the narrative, it will then be seen what like abandonment befell myself. Chapter 94 A Squeeze of the Hand that whale of stubs, so dearly purchased, was duly brought to the Pequod's side, where all those cutting and hoisting operations previously detailed, were regularly gone through, even to the bailing of the Heidelberg ton, or case. While some were occupied with this latter duty, others were employed in dragging away the larger tubs, so soon as filled with the sperm, and when the proper time arrived, this same sperm was carefully manipulated ere going to the triworks, of which anon. It had cooled and crystallized to such a degree, that when, with several others, I sat down before a large Constantine's bath of it, I found it strangely concreted into lumps, here and there rolling about in the liquid part. It was our business to squeeze these lumps back into fluid. A sweet and unctuous duty. No wonder that in old times the sperm was such a favorite cosmetic. Such a clearer. Such a sweetener. Such a softener. Such a delicious mollifier. After having my hands in it for only a few minutes, my fingers felt like eels and began, as it were, to serpentine and spiralize. As I sat there at my ease, cross-legged on the deck, after the bitter exertion at the windlass, under a blue tranquil sky, the ship under indolent sail, and gliding so serenely along, as I bathed my hands among those soft, gentle globules of infiltrated tissues, woven almost within the hour, as they richly broke to my fingers, and discharged all their opulence, like fully ripe grapes their wine, as I snuffed up that uncontaminated aroma, literally and truly, like the smell of spring violets, I declare to you, that for the time I lived as in a musky meadow, I forgot all about our horrible oath, in that inexpressible sperm, I washed my hands and my heart of it, I almost began to credit the old Paracelsian superstition that sperm is of rare virtue in allaying the heat of anger, while bathing in that bath, I felt divinely free from all ill will, or petulance, or malice, of any sort whatsoever. Squeeze. 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 All the morning long, I squeezed that sperm till I myself almost melted into it, I squeezed that sperm till a strange sort of insanity came over me, and I found myself unwittingly squeezing my co-laborers' hands in it, mistaking their hands for the gentle globules. Such an abounding, affectionate, friendly, loving feeling did this avocation beget, that at last I was continually squeezing their hands, and looking up into their eyes sentimentally, as much as to say, oh. My dear fellow beings, why should we longer cherish any social acerbities, or know the slightest ill humor or envy? Come, let us squeeze hands all round, nay, let us all squeeze ourselves into each other, 
let us squeeze ourselves universally into the very milk and sperm of kindness. Would that I could keep squeezing that sperm forever. For now, since by many prolonged, repeated experiences, I have perceived that in all cases man must eventually lower, or at least shift, his conceit of attainable felicity, not placing it anywhere in the intellect or the fancy, but in the wife, the heart, the bed, the table, the saddle, the fireside, the country, now that I have perceived all this, I am ready to squeeze case eternally. In thoughts of the visions of the night, I saw long rows of angels in paradise, each with his hands in a jar of spermaceti. Now, while discoursing of sperm, it behooves to speak of other things akin to it, in the business of preparing the sperm whale for the triworks. First comes white horse, so called, which is obtained from the tapering part of the fish, and also from the thicker portions of his flukes. It is tough with congealed tendons, a wad of muscle, but still contains some oil. After being severed from the whale, the white horse is first cut into portable oblongs ere going to the mincer. They look much like blocks of Berkshire marble. Plum pudding is the term bestowed upon certain fragmentary parts of the whale's flesh, here and there adhering to the blanket of blubber, and often participating to a considerable degree in its unctuousness. It is a most refreshing, convivial, beautiful object to behold. As its name imports, it is of an exceedingly rich, mottled tint, with a bestreaked snowy and golden ground, dotted with spots of the deepest crimson and purple. It is plums of rubies, in pictures of citron. Spite of reason, it is hard to keep yourself from eating it. I confess, that once I stole behind the foremast to try it. It tasted something as I should conceive a royal cutlet from the thigh of Louis Le Gros might have tasted, supposing him to have been killed the first day after the venison season, and that particular venison season contemporary with an unusually fine vintage of the vineyards of Champagne. There is another substance, and a very singular one, which turns up in the course of this business, but which I feel it to be very puzzling adequately to describe. It is called Slobgullion, an appellation original with the whalemen, and even so is the nature of the substance. It is an ineffably oozy, stringy affair, most frequently found in the tubs of sperm, after a prolonged squeezing, and subsequent decanting. I hold it to be the wondrously thin, ruptured membranes of the case, coalescing. Guri, so called, is a term properly belonging to right whalemen, but sometimes incidentally used by the sperm fishermen. It designates the dark, glutinous substance which is scraped off the back of the Greenland or right whale, and much of which covers the decks of those inferior souls who hunt that ignoble leviathan. Nippers. Strictly this word is not indigenous to the whale's vocabulary. But as applied by whalemen, it becomes so. A whaleman's nipper is a short firm strip of tendinous stuff cut from the tapering part of leviathan's tail, it averages an inch in thickness, and for the rest, is about the size of the iron part of a hoe. Edgewise moved along the oily deck, it operates like a leathern squilgy, and by nameless blandishments, as of magic, allures along with it all impurities. But to learn all about these recondite matters, your best way is at once to descend into the blubber room, and have a long talk with its inmates. This place has previously been mentioned as the receptacle for the blanket pieces, when stripped and hoisted from the whale. When the proper time arrives for cutting up its contents, this apartment is a scene of terror to all tyros, especially by night. On one side, lit by a dull lantern, a space has been left clear for the workmen. They generally go in pairs, a pican gathman and a spade man. The whaling pike is similar to a frigate's boarding weapon of the same name. The gaff is something like a boat hook. With his gaff, the gaffman hooks onto a sheet of blubber, and strives to hold it from slipping, as the ship pitches and lurches about. Meanwhile, the spade man stands on the sheet itself, perpendicularly chopping it into the portable horse pieces. This spade is sharp as hone can make it, the spade man's feet are shoeless, the thing he stands on will sometimes irresistibly slide away from him, like a sledge. If he cuts off one of his own toes, or one of his assistants, would you be very much astonished? Toes are scarce among veteran blubber room men. Chapter 95. The Cassock. Had you stepped on board the Pequod at a certain juncture of this postmortemizing of the whale, and had you strolled forward nigh the windlass, pretty sure am I that you would have scanned with no small curiosity a very strange, enigmatical object, which you would have seen there, lying along lengthwise in the lee scuppers. Not the wondrous cistern in the whale's huge head, not the prodigy of his unhinged lower jaw, not the miracle of his symmetrical tail, none of these would so surprise you, as half a glimpse of that unaccountable cone, longer than a Kentuckian is tall, nigh a foot in diameter at the base, 
and jet black as Yojo, the ebony idol of Queequeg. And an idol, indeed, it is, or, rather, in old times, its likeness was. Such an idol as that found in the secret groves of Queen Macha in Judea, and for worshipping which, King Asa, her son, did depose her, and destroyed the idol, and burnt it for an abomination at the brook Kedron, as darkly set forth in the fifteenth chapter of the first book of Kings. Look at the sailor, called the Mincer, who now comes along, and assisted by two allies, heavily backs the Grandissimus, as the mariners call it, and with bowed shoulders, staggers off with it as if he were a grenadier carrying a dead comrade from the field. Extending it upon the forecastle deck, he now proceeds cylindrically to remove its dark pelt, as an African hunter, the pelt of a boa. This done he turns the pelt inside out, like a pantaloon leg, gives it a good stretching, so as almost to double its diameter, and at last hangs it, while spread, in the rigging, to dry. Ere long, it is taken down, when removing some three feet of it, towards the pointed extremity, and then cutting two slits for armholes at the other end, he lengthwise slips himself bodily into it. The mincer now stands before you invested in the full canonicals of his calling. Immemorial to all his order, this investiture alone will adequately protect him, while employed in the peculiar functions of his office. That office consists in mincing the horse pieces of blubber for the pots, an operation which is conducted at a curious wooden horse, planted endwise against the bulwarks, and with a capacious tub beneath it, into which the minced pieces drop, fast as the sheets from a wrapped orator's desk. Arrayed in decent black, occupying a conspicuous pulpit, intent on Bible leaves, what a candidate for an archbishopric, what a lad for a pope were this mincer, asterisk. Asterisk Bible leaves. Bible leaves. This is the invariable cry from the mates to the mincer. It enjoins him to be careful, and cut his work into as thin slices as possible, inasmuch as by so doing the business of boiling out the oil is much accelerated, and its quantity considerably increased, besides perhaps improving it in quality.